Hi, I'm Katie Huntley. I'm the director of the Labarna Urban Landscapes Project that is investigating a Roman colonial city in Northwest Italy. Today, I wanna to introduce you to the project, what we've done, what we hope to do, and most importantly, why Labarna is so interesting and has so much potential to answer some fascinating questions about the past. So we've been working at Labarna now since 2015. One important component of our work has been archival research. It might not sound like the most interesting thing, but actually it's been fascinating and challenging. Labarna has a long complicated history of archeological work that spans the last 200 years. There's been a lot of archeology span done there, but it was done a long time ago and the data is very fragmentary. We've also done three seasons of geophysical survey and aerial photography that has helped us to flesh out the map of Labarna with new data for areas of the city that were previously unknown or undocumented. We have also been able to confirm or correct previously held knowledge of the structures of Labarna, such as those that were excavated in the 19th and early 20th centuries, when the documentation was perhaps not as rigorous or complete as it is now. So why is Labarna so interesting? Labarna has the potential to tell us a lot about Rome's nascent Mediterranean empire. The city was founded during an early critical period in Rome's imperial expansion, and it marked some of the earliest expansion into a region inhabited by non-Italic peoples. Today, Labarna is in a region of the modern nation state of Italy, but in ancient times, it was inhabited by Gallic peoples. It was an area called Cisalpine Gaul by the Romans and was not considered part of Italia, which only encompassed peninsular Italy. So Cisalpine Gaul was the northern area that connects to the continent. So, um, so called Cisalpine Gaul by the Romans. Uh, and so Labarna can offer us insight into how Rome learned to control conquered Gallic populations and how that control impacted indigenous Gallic culture. And it can help us understand how that indigenous culture endured under imperial control. Cisalpine Gaul, and in particular, the province of Liguria, where Labarna was, represents a kind of significant gap in our knowledge of Roman archaeology. There's been some really good work done in the region, but it hasn't been properly incorporated um, or fully incorporated into our understanding of Roman archaeology. For example, with Roman urbanism, so much of what we know comes from Central and Southern Italy, Tuscany, Lazio, and Campania. Uh, and places like Cisalpine Gaul, like Liguria, have been sort of underrepresented. And so we're trying uh, to correct that. Um, so with this gap, Labarna serves as an important and prosperous settlement uh, of evidence about the cultural interactions between the Romans uh, and the peoples uh, of Northwest Europe, of Northwest Italy. Due to modern development, no, what knowledge we have gained from excavations at Labarna is pretty fragmentary. While rescue excavations and targeted research have taken place somewhat sporadically at Labarna for nearly two centuries, there's never been a holistic research-driven study of the site. So before we get into Labarna, I just want to introduce you briefly to Liguria and the Ligurians, the physical and cultural context of Labarna. We do have some historical sources about the peoples of Liguria, though none from the Ligurians themselves. We have the writings of Strabo, a geographer, Livy, the famous historian of Rome under the Emperor Augustus, and Pliny, the naturalist and author who wrote A Natural History and famously died trying to rescue friends during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. The region was inhabited by numerous distinct tribes that had a shared language and probably a consciousness of a common origin, but nonetheless, they had distinct identities. They were, the tribes were probably fairly small, consisting of a few thousand people based in regional centers and probably extending their territory only through single valleys. They practiced a mix of pastoralism and agriculture, and the ancient sources, of course, stress their warrior-like character and prowess. The Gauls were, after all, the boogeymen of Romans' nightmares. The Roman conquest of the region and transformation into an imperial province, the province of Liguria, 
took place over an extended period of time. In the third century, between Rome's wars with Carthage, the Ligurians and Romans engaged, <laughs> excuse me, engaged in a number of violent clashes. But it was during the early decades of the second century BC that the Romans really decimated the Ligurians in a series of wars that supposedly led to a large portion of the population being exterminated. Roman control was solidified with the founding of the Roman colony at Luni, and Roman colonies were settled with military veterans and were therefore a key way that Rome controlled its imperial holdings. Full subjugation and reorganization of the region into the formal province of Liguria happened at the end of the first century BC under Rome's first emperor, Augustus. The road networks were a fundamental way that Rome controlled and administered its various provinces. One of these roads in particular played an important role in the development and life of Labarna. Uh, that's the Via Postumia, and I'll talk about that in a minute. The road network was carefully maintained and guarded. While they naturally became important parts of the economy, they were first and foremost a tool to deploy troops quickly to places of trouble and to administer the regions. There were guard stations along all the roads and the maintenance of the roads was of utmost importance. There were even magistrates specifically in charge of doing so called the curatores viarum. We also get um, things like itineraries, ancient road maps like the one uh, here on the slide. This is a section of the famous Pudinger tablet, um, a seven meter long document depicting the road network from the Ganges in the east to Spain in the west. And this section shows Liguria and Labarna even appears on it where the arrow is pointing almost dead in the center. This is the consular road that played a important role in the development and prosperity of Labarna, the Via Postumia, opened in 148 BC and built by the consul Spurius Postumius Albino. It connected Genoa on the west coast with Aquileia on the east, and it constituted one of the main arteries of Cisalpine Gaul. Traditionally, the date of Labarna's foundation is the same as the opening of the Via Postumia. The road was instrumental in developing the important urban centers along it. So on to Labarna itself. The visible remains are constituted into an archeological park, the primary features of which are on this slide. Uh, two city blocks over here and their adjacent roads, uh, an amphitheater, and then to the Northwest, a Greek style theater. The visible remains date to the first century AD, probably during the reign of the Emperor Claudius, when there seems to have been a big building program. But the earlier remains of the old colony are no doubt still beneath them. And while much of the archaeological work done thus far has only really gone down to these layers, and so not as much focus has been or investigation of the earlier periods has taken place, uh, particularly the late Republican period when the colony was new. But these visible remains are only a small part of what was a fairly large city. The image on the left is a photo mosaic made using images from our drone that shows the majority of the area that constituted the ancient city of Labarna. One interesting thing that is plainly visible is that the route of the old Via Postumia today is still a major thoroughfare. The ancient city is bisected now by a modern highway and two railway lines in the same way the Via Postumia bisected it in ancient times. The area, the arrow, excuse me, is pointing uh, to the visible remains of the Via Postumia. Uh, and you can see how it's directly parallel to the modern highway. The area to the east of the highway is the archeological park. The west is privately owned farmland. The layout of the city is pretty standard for Roman cities. They all looked very much alike in terms of their organization. They're basically kind of like Ikea cities, quick and easy to build following a set plan. The amphitheater is on the outskirts of the city since we all know that sporting arenas can get loud and fans get rowdy and drunk. Between the theater here, uh, sort of to the top left and the amphitheater was um, a bath complex now covered over. But it created sort of this leisure district in the city with all these elements, the theater, the bath complex, the amphitheater. 
At the center of the city, underneath a modern farm field and the highway, was Libanus Forum. In Roman cities, the Forum was a civic, economic, and religious center. And we've identified the remains of two temples and a basilica, the latter which was the law court of a Roman city. The city was also built on a grid system, which you can see in this other plan, um, with all the roads meeting at right angles and city blocks organized into squares or rectangles. And so in this modern image, uh, you can see what you see is a projection of the grid system based on the excavated areas. So the map here shows the various fields we've been able to survey. The letters are ones we've given to designate the individual fields. And as you can see, the borders are really dependent on modern property values. So they don't, they aren't, um, they don't correspond to any sort of significant uh, organizational differentiation at Labarna, if you will. So here outlined in red are the areas I'm gonna talk about today to discuss different aspects of our survey work and some of the interesting findings we have. So this is Dronita the drone. We affectionately call her Dronita. And she helped us capture some truly spectacular evidence of subsur subsurface archeology, span particularly during our 2017 field season, when we had a confluence of conditions that made it perfect for seeing and recording crop marks made by subsurface archeological remains. This included, uh, these circumstances included extremely dry drought conditions and the widespread cultivation of alfalfa. More on that uh, soon. So why does archeology span affect the growth of plants or at least some plants? We're able to see the archeology span when it impacts the growth of roots and the height and health of the plants. If the roots encounter something solid like a wall or a paved floor, it inhibits root, gro root growth and the plant will be shorter and not as healthy as the crop around it. On the other hand, if the plant's roots are growing into an archeological feature that has displaced the dirt, the roots will actually grow deeper and the crop will appear healthier or taller than that around it. So in the picture on the left from Labarna, you can see how the road and the remains of the walls have inhibited the crop growth. So these two, these appear to be, um, rooms in a building and that may have had paved floors. Um, but you can see just how, again, how dramatic uh, the difference is. And you can see the same thing here where uh, this photo features the Via Postumia um, and just the way that the drought amplified the crop marks. Um, they're so detailed that you can even see individual paving stones, column bases, interior divisions in the buildings. Um, it was also significant that these fields were planted with alfalfa, which is harvested several times a year. And so the drought conditions hit just at the same time as a new crop was coming in. So um, the new crop was particularly vulnerable because of its young age. It was particularly vulnerable to those um, drought conditions. So, uh, so on the right, you can see what we call field W, which was uh, Labarna's forum. And you can see kind of the difference between the old plan and what we've found. Uh, so the forum was originally excavated in the early 19th century by Gaetano Poggi. And it, was, it recovered the remains of one temple, half of another temple, which we can see in our photo the entirety of that temple structure. Uh, and then in the 19th, uh, the early 20th century, they found what they thought was a basilica to the south. Uh, but in fact, the basilica is to the north above the, the north temple. And you can see it here very clearly. Um, the presence of these two temples is particularly interesting and, and more so when you take into their plans. So the temple at the top fits very much closely with the traditional Roman style temple plans that we see at other colonies such as Luni. Um, but the plan of the lower temple uh, appears to look more like the plans of temples we see uh, at other sites in Cisalpine Gaul and then across the Alps into Northwest Europe, um, even as far North as Britain. And here you can see, this is the, um, 
the plan of a so-called Romano Celtic temple in Britain called Maiden Castle. Uh, there's a reconstruction of, of Maiden Castle, not of the structure at Labarna. Um, but you can see how similar it is to, uh, to our uh, Southern temple, if you will. So interesting to see in the center, the heart of Labarna, that cultural mix going on. So on this map in red is the information we were able to add with Dronita and some modest information from electrical resistivity work that we did in 2017. So you can see how useful the drone was in recovering that information. We were able to add about eight hectares of data to Labarna's map. So it was just a really spectacular season as far as the aerial photography goes. So, so these are the geophysical techniques we used over the course of our three survey seasons, each with varying success. In perfect conditions, using these three techniques together would allow us to capture the most archeological evidence. But alas, we never have perfect conditions, do we? So magnetometry measures changes in the Earth's geomagnetic field that are caused by archaeological features. It is extremely sensitive to the presence of any metal. So unfortunately, we found that with all the metal fencing, signs, underground electrical wires, there was simply too much noise for magnetometry to be useful. So we also used electrical resistivity, which we had a little bit more success with. It measures the speed of an electrical charge moving between two probes. Uh, unfortunately, it requires some moisture in the soil to work properly. So the drought conditions here made it much more difficult. We were able to get some results, but the drought definitely ne negatively impacted the use of this tool. Finally, our most successful geophysical survey tool was the ground penetrating radar. It worked in a similar way to an electrical resistivity machine, except with a radio wave rather than an electrical charge. It has the added benefit of providing information on the depth of the archeological features. It can also penetrate pavement and work in dry conditions, but the sensor must have contact with the ground, so it cannot work in an area with high vegetation. Field F is in the area that contained uh, Labarna's bath complex. It lies to the east of the theater and north of the amphitheater. The baths were excavated first in the 19th century by the priest Gian Francesco Capuro. They were also the target of excavations in 2016, a campaign undertaken by the local superintendenza. And so we were able with our ground penetrating radar, the results which you can see on the right, to not only confirm the location of the bath complex, but also to confirm the 19th century drawings of John Francesco Capuro. Uh, so while we didn't find any new structures there per se, uh, the confirmation of that old information was very useful. Finally, we have Field A, uh, which I'll close with. This field is located at the south of the archeological park. Limited excavations took place here in the early aughts, so very small scale, and they unfortunately have not been published. We're interested in this field for a number of reasons. First, its proximity to the uh, other excavated insula blocks, city blocks, which you can see the corner of one uh, at the top of this slide. Uh, and you can see how our GPL our results confirm, again, the grid system of Labarna. Uh, secondly, we're interested in this area because we want to focus on domestic structures and the non-civic architecture. So um, most of the research done at Labarna has focused on the civic architecture, the forum, the bath complex, the theater and amphitheater. There was some work done in the 1970s on the two city blocks, but it didn't do a very detailed study of the artifacts. So they're sort of being stored at the local museum, uh, sort of sitting there with, without their kind of good archeological context being used to study them. And so what we wanna do is do a close artifactual study of uh, the materials that we excavate. So putting those artifacts back in their archeological context. Um, the other reason we're interested in this area is simply because we had such good ground penetrating radar results. I mean, you can see just how spectacular they are on this slide. Uh, and this will allow us to target with great uh, detail and efficiency 
whatever structures or parts of structures we want to excavate. So if we want to get a section of road, we know where to drop our trench. If we want to uh, get a single, a single specific room, we know where to put our trench. Uh, so it's really, these results are really spectacular and amazing. Um, so just to kind of sum things up with, a, with an image, the red on this picture you can see is all the information we've added over three years of survey uh, to the map of Labarna. So we've really got a much more fleshed out picture of what the ancient city was like. And it's gonna set us up really well to excavate not only in field A, but in the future, um, you know, other parts of the city, whether that be civic architecture or domestic or other types of public structures. So, um, so very successful survey, despite some of the uh, difficulties we ran into. So um, thank you so much for listening. If you're interested in the project, please support us by uh, following our research at the uh, website above. And hopefully we're going to be excavating this summer COVID permitting, of course, and so we uh, we try to keep the blog updated with news about our field seasons uh, and what we're doing. So thank you so much and take care.